Okay, let's take a look at some example style questions as to what we could be looking at for consumer theory. Uh, let's just jump into it. We'll have three altogether that we'll evaluate today, and then we'll move forward from there. So, okay, here we have our first one. We have Bill. Bill is a utility maximizing individual. So, okay, that there, that is your hint. Utility maximizing. That means that we're going to have marginal utility of X all over our price of X equal to our marginal utility of Y all over the price of Y. Because at this point, we have a utility maximizing bundle. Okay, what do we have? We have burgers. So from his last burger at $5, he received an extra utility of 50. So he received 50 extra utility. So extra utility for an extra unit, that's my marginal utility. If Bill is also consuming movies at $10, what is the extra utility he would receive from the last movie watched? Okay, well, let's just update our little equation here. Let's just get rid of the X. Let's get rid of the Y. And that is, let's update this to be a marginal utility of burgers all over the price of burgers. And then the marginal utility of movies all over the price of movies. From here, let's substitute, let's update what we know. So, okay, we know that the price of a burger is five. So, okay, five, burger five, equals price of a movie was 10. What do I have as well? He received an extra 50 utility from the last burger consumed. So that's my marginal utility, right? The extra utility received from the last unit. So consumed an extra burger, got an extra 50 satisfaction. If Bill is utility maximizing, what then is the marginal utility of movies? Well, hey. If we take a look at this, we have everything but this one unknown. We can just do some algebra, some cross multiplication, if you will, and we can find our one unknown. So in order to do that, what we're gonna do is we're gonna times by 10, times by 10, right? That cancels out this guy, leaving us on this side, 10 times 50 divided by five, right? What is that? That is 10 times 50, all over five, that's a times. 10 times 50 divided by five, well, that's gonna be 500 over five, 100. So 100 equals our marginal utility of movies. So that is, yes, Bill got an extra 50 satisfaction from his last burger. He got an extra 100 satisfaction from his last movie. But satisfaction per dollar is equated such that, right, if we work this out, 50 over 5 equals 100 over 10. And both of those would break down. 50 over 5 is 10 satisfaction per dollar is equal to 10 extra satisfaction per dollar spent. So there we go. We are utility maximizing and Bill is happy. Well, let's take a look at another one. Let's take a look at the next example. Okay, here we have Jill. Okay, Jill is consuming 10 donuts a month at a price of $4. So, okay, what do we have? There are 20 consumers identical to Jill. So, okay, essentially we can just presume there's 20 of them. What is the quantity demanded by the market at $4? Okay, uh, given this question, I'm going to presume that it means all together, including Jill. There's 20 people, right? 20 consumers identical to Jill. Jill, I'm going to presume, is one of these. So that is, we're going to have number of consumers being 20. We know that the... Um, we know that the price is equal to 4... What we are looking for is the quantity demanded in the market. And in the market altogether, well, okay. How are we going to find that out? Well, we do know that Jill, based off of her personal demand, uh, she was consuming 10. 
right? That is, right, if we think about this, we have Jill's personal demand here. We have price. We have quantity demanded. That could also be quantity donuts, but quantity demanded. And we don't know what Jill's entire demand curve looks like, but what we do know is that, uh, wrong tool again. What we do know is that at a price of four, I'm just gonna draw this straight across. We'll see why in a second. At a price of four, Jill is consuming 10 donuts. So although we don't know what the actual full curve looks like, we do know this single point on her demand curve. That hey, at $4, she buys 10. What we are trying to find is, yeah, okay, this is nice. This is the personal demand. We want that market demand. So for the market, we'll have price of donuts. We'll have quantity demanded. And in this case here, this is our market demand. And market demand for donuts is really what it is. What we need to figure out is, hey, what is, what is this quantity demanded? All right, again, we're going to have this point. We don't know the whole demand curve. We just know, hey, the price is $4. What is this quantity demanded? You can imagine there probably is some demand curve that's going down like this. I just know that one point. Further, what I know is I know that there's 20 gels all together. So that is, there are 20 people with this exact same personal demand profile. I mean, there's 20 people that buy 10 donuts at $4. So, okay, that is, if we were to aggregate all of those 20 people up to get my market demand, all right, you could imagine that 10 plus 10 plus 10 plus 10, all the way for person one, person two, person three, person 20, or wait, instead of just going 10 plus 10 plus 10 or 20 times, couldn't we just go 10 times 20? Same, same thing, right? So 10 times 20, that's what? That's 200. So altogether, what's our quantity demanded in the market? 200 donuts would be demanded altogether if this market was being met by 20 gels, all buying 10 each. At $4, we would have a quantity demanded of 200 donuts. So we can work through it in that kind of way. Let's take a look at the last and final example for this. Okay, we have Hank. Hank has preferences for pizza and everything else, right? So that's what he's split between. Pizza and then all the other goods that he's interested in. We want to decompose a price increase in pizza into its income and substitution effects. We want to derive Hank's personal demand for pizza. So, okay, it's not explicitly listed in the question here, but two assumptions I need to make, right? And ideally, maybe if this question was worded a bit better, I wouldn't need to make these assumptions. So first one is I need to assume that Hank is a utility maximizing individual. Now, okay, that's actually not a big assumption for us to state because that's our fundamental assumption about consumers. So yeah, that's an easy assumption to make. The second assumption is that I need to assume that pizza, that pizza is a normal good. That is, I need to assume that it's a normal good such that when my income goes up, my quantity of pizza goes up as well. Right? There's nothing in this question to say, hey, pizza is normal or pizza is inferior. But as the name suggests, often unless we say otherwise, we have normal goods because it's, well, it's normal. So what we're going to do, we want to decompose an increase in price into its substitution and income effects. And then we want to derive Hank's personal demand curve for pizza. So personal demand for pizza. What do we know? Well, we know that to start off, we have this 
Oh, wrong tool again. We have our marginal utility of pizza all over price of pizza will be marginal utility of everything else all over the price of everything else. So, okay, presume we're utility maximizing, we're starting off here. Meaning, if we're starting off there, we have some initial price, and at that initial price, we have some initial quantity which we are consuming. So we are find ourselves at this point here. All right, so we'll say that this is pizza one, our initial quantity demanded. Actually, that's a lot to write. I don't want to write pizza one and then pizza two. I'm just going to cheat. I'm going to call that Q1. That's my initial quantity demanded. And that there is at some initial price P1. Right, that's why I didn't use P for pizza, because P for price. That's our common notation there. What do we have happening? What are we trying to do? We are trying to decompose a price increase in pizza into its income and substitution effects. So, okay, let's suppose that price of pizza goes up. So, if price of pizza goes up, this whole term here is going to get smaller. So, okay, let's work through that. What does that mean for us? We're going to have marginal utility of pizza all over this new price, price prime, and we're going to have marginal utility of everything else all over price of everything else. In this case here, this whole left term got smaller, so it's less, and we'll decompose that into substitution and income effects. So, okay, first, substitution. We want to buy more of the one that makes us happy. So, okay, we want more of everything else. And that means if we have more than everything else, given our scarce resources, we have trade-offs. So more of everything else means less pizza. So quantity pizza goes down. Quantity everything else goes up. How does this influence our marginal utility? Well, marginal utility of pizza that last slice of pizza I have, I'll get more satisfaction from because I'm eating less of it. And everything else that I'm buying, well, because I'm buying more of it, my marginal utility falls. From an income perspective, okay, price has gone up. So an increase in price, I feel relatively poor. So if I feel relatively poor, I'm going to have less pizza. I'm going to have less of everything else. And that means my marginal utility of pizza will be going up. My marginal utility of everything else will be going up. All of this will work itself through such that it all re-equates, right? I'll change my quantities, changing my marginal utilities, and I'll end up with a new marginal utility of pizza all over my change of price of pizza equal to my new marginal utility of everything else all over price of everything else, which is unchanged, right? There's no, There's been no change in the price of everything else. So that guy's staying the same. So we've taken a look at how, how our two effects are decomposed, how we re-equate to get our new optimal consumption bundle. How does this work to get us our demand, right? Essentially, all we have right now is what we worked out for Jill here. We have some price and some quantity, Woo, right? We have some price and some quantity, some single point on our demand line. Well, what have we just worked out? We have said that substitution has caused the quantity of pizza to fall. Income has caused the quantity of pizza to fall. Altogether, we have witnessed a price increase. So, okay, let's first go and show this price increase. There we go. I'll call that my new higher price two. So price has gone up. As price has gone up, starting off with my substitution effect, starting at Q1 here, I'm substituting away from pizza towards everything else, right? Quantity pizza has fallen. Then my income effect kicks in. I'm feeling relatively poor, so my substitution effect ended right there. 
My income effect, smaller effect, relatively speaking, brings me that rest of the way. And that brings me to this point here. We can call that Q2. And filling that point in and then extrapolating, we can get our demand curve as, ah, uh, that wasn't a very good one. There we go, our demand curve as such, such that I get Hank's personal demand curve for pizza. Finish labeling everything, this blue guy, that was my substitution effect. That tinier green one, that was my income effect. So Hank's personal demand for pizza decomposed into the two impacts, increase in price causing a decrease in quantity, where that decrease in quantity is explained by these two effects. Ultimately, right, as we work this out, if we had a price change, we could then, right, price change if we knew the number and we knew, hey, let's say this was, oh, actually, let's just do that. Let's just add to this question. Forget the hypothetical. Let's say that initially, Hank had a demand for 10 pizzas, maybe a month, and that was at a price of $15 a pizza. We'll presume that the price of pizza goes up to $20, and Hank's demand falls to, well, what? Let's say, boom, boom, let's say Hank's demand falls to seven pizzas. If we presume that this pizza market is served by seven individuals, um, no, I just picked seven because of that, let's make that easier. This pizza market is being serviced by 10 individuals identical to Hank. Let's derive the market, oh, the market demand. So let's derive this market demand, presuming that this market is made up of 10 people, all with the exact same demand curve as Hank has. So, well, how do we do that? The way that we do that is, we take a look at our market demand curve. So let's draw that here, wrong tool. Really bad at that today. There's my vertical. There's my horizontal axis, so. Quantity demanded price. Let's just carry forward these price signs. So if we do that, that was my price at $15. This guy here, there's my price at $20. Oh, let's try to make that a straight line. There we go. That was my price at $20. What we need to figure out is, okay, what was my market? quantity demand at each of these points, right? Ultimately, okay, we could just be lazy. We could go, hey, boom, there's my, there's my market demand, go demand and market demand. But what we're really interested in is we wanna know, hey, what are these quantity demanded here? When the price was 15, when the price is 20, what's going on? Well, okay, we have Hank's personal demand curve. We can imagine that we have 10 of these all composing up this market demand. So that is, well, at 15, right? At 15, Hank had a demand for 10 pizzas. Well, that was just Hank. There's another nine people with the exact same demand. So 10 pizzas times 10 people gives me a total market demand of 100 pizzas at a price of 15. As the price of pizza goes up, my quantity demanded due to substitution and income effects fell to seven. And we're presuming this is for all 10 people in the market. 
So, okay, seven, 10 people, right? So again, that'd be like seven plus seven plus four, seven times 10 would give us a market quantity demanded of 70. And we get this demand curve, market demand for pizza. Follow-up question then, right? We can just keep adding to this. We can start playing around with this more. And we could say, okay, what is the, uh, let's see, let's make some room. Let's just focus on the market demand. And let's say, what is the maximum willingness to pay for the 70th pizza? What is the highest price that you'd be willing to pay in order to buy your 70th slice of pizza? Well, in that case there, our demand definition goes price, curve, quantity. Our maximum willingness to pay definition goes, okay, at 70 pizzas, the most I'd be willing to pay for that 70th pizza is 20 bucks. So $20 is the most I'd be willing to pay for that last pizza, that 70th pizza. Very similarly, I could say, um, what is the extra benefit, right? That's marginal benefit. The extra benefit you receive from your hundredth pizza. Right, that is, if we were to frame it, phrase it as like, hey, if I were to say, hey, wait, instead of going from 99 to 100 pizzas, I stop you. And I would say, okay, okay, instead of buying this 100th pizza, what is that price, right? What is going to be that point that you're indifferent between accepting my money or buying that pizza? What is that value you get from this last slice of pizza? Well, again, this value Turns out this value is going to be one and the same as your maximum willingness to pay. That's why that's your maximum willingness to pay, because you're willing to pay up to the value you're going to get. And so in this case here, your hundredth slice of pizza, well, the value you get from that hundredth slice of pizza is 15. That would be the monetized equivalent of the benefit or the value you receive. So in this case here, marginal benefit, your extra benefit received from your hundredth pizza as we just go, okay, there's 100 up across, there's my value, that value is that marginal benefit. That value is also my maximum willingness to pay. So different interpretations, just working through it mathematically instead of just generically speaking. And right, there really wasn't much math, we just threw in numbers, that's what made it kind of mathy. But other than that, exact same scenario. Okay, a few different examples to take a look at here as we went through our building up of consumer theory into building up our market demand curve. We'll end there for this week. Again, next week what we're gonna be taking a look at is developing our workhorse model of supply and demand. So we'll leave it there. Until next time.